Okay, I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation. We're going to read the first chapter. I'm not sure how far we will get, but at least we will read the first chapter. And I want to kind of title this uh, chapter, uh, In the Spirit on the Lord's Day. In the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So beginning in verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and, all, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word uh, to us uh, this morning. Now, we've already looked at some of the introductory words of this chapter but I want to just point out a few more words that are very significant uh, that we need to think about. First of all, uh, we want to uh, notice that uh, it tells us in verse one that he's writing things which must shortly uh, come to pass. And so we want to just mention this idea of the word shortly here. Uh, the Greek word comes from a word takos. Uh, not where we get the Mexican tacos from, but where we get the word tachometer, uh, you know, on a car tells you how how much is revving up. And so the idea is is simply this. It, it, the idea is that rapid rapidity of execution once it begins, once these 
events begin to occur, it will be sudden, it will gain in velocity and unfold in rapid succession. And no man or anyone else will be able to stop it. Uh, it it's going to, as it were, rev up and these things are going to come to pass. Uh, another uh, important word in this section is must. It says uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Uh, in other words, uh, it, these things have to happen. It is necessary. It is binding. However unexpected, unforeseen, unwanted by men, there's an inescapable program that will be carried into effect by God. It must shortly come to pass. And then also just another phrase that is of great significance in this little section. Uh, John uh, speaks to himself as an apostle, apostle and he says here, uh, our servant, he says, which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. And I want to just focus on this word signified. Of course, it's linked to a word that we're well familiar with, with John. Signify is connected to the word sign, right? And so uh, John's gospel was about signs. It was also about sevens, seven signs. Well, we're now back in the realm of sevens because all the way we've already seen through the book of Revelation, there are sevens repeated over and over again. But also uh, the word signified, the prophecy uh, that John is going to be shown is not conveyed in plain speech, but in symbols and signs. And so that's why it mentions he sent and signified it by his angel. So we're going to be looking at a lot of symbols and a lot of signs. Now they're accessible, they're explainable, because we've already said that these symbols and these signs are referred to often in the Old Testament. And we, we need to just constantly be going back to the Old Testament to see the significance of these signs and these symbols. And we said that in this book, 278 out of 404 verses have inferences or allusions to the Old Testament. So that's 70% of the book makes some reference to the Old Testament. And uh, just incidentally, and we'll point it out as we go, but also there's a great deal of tabernacle references in the book of Revelation. So it helps if you have some grasp of the tabernacle right here in this chapter. We've got these lampstands. And again, that re reminds us of the golden lampstand in the tabernacle, doesn't it? And so right, right in the very first chapter, we've got our first, as it were, tabernacle illusion. And so again, if you really want to understand the book of Revelation, you need to read the whole Bible. Right. That's the that's the key. Uh, it, it's all of the scripture flows into this marvelous book. So these things that must shortly come to pass. Notice in verse two, it says, speaking of John, uh, his servant, John, who bear record of the word of God. And again, we think back uh, to his gospel. Uh, he certainly bore record to the word of God. He opens his gospel with these words. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And uh, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He bare record to the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. And so we certainly see that in the past that he did that. But now he also is going to once again bear record of the word of God. Because, again, we've got a connection here. When Jesus comes, uh, he's got a name written on his thigh, which is the word of God. He's going to once again bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And notice what he's going to do of all the things that he saw. One of the phrases we'll see throughout the book is going to be this, and I saw, and I looked, and I saw. And so, again, what we're saying is this is, is not like getting uh, kind of direct revelation in terms of words, but he's seeing a lot of symbol, symbolic visions, and he's giving us what he saw. He's testifying to what he saw. 
And then verse three, we've already alluded to it, but again, just want to uh, refer to this, that this is the first of seven beatitudes connected with this glorious book of Revelation. And so blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And again, just um, originally, he that readeth would refer to the one who would read the letter to the assembly. Uh, remember that uh, in those days, uh, they didn't have a printing press. Uh, the letters were, were written uh, uh, by hand, and therefore somebody would read the letter to the church. And so the one who reads it is going to get a blessing, and those that hear the words of this prophecy are also going to get a blessing, and especially if they keep those things which are written. And so, again, we're promised that there is a blessing concerning this. Interestingly enough, that in the Anglican Church, uh, in their uh, readings, because they all read the same thing, you know, they have the same readings, uh, the, the book of Revelation is omitted from their annual reading schedule. And so our poor Anglican brethren, uh, those that are truly saved, they miss the blessing of having that book read to them. Uh, but we certainly are going to get a blessing as we read and we hear uh, this book. And especially if we keep those things, if we observe those things that are written. And certainly this prophecy ought to have a powerful influence upon our lives. And prophecy certainly can have that impact, can't it, upon us. When we realize these things must shortly come to pass, surely it ought to stir us out of our lethargy and fill us with zeal for serving God while we still have an opportunity. And so, again, we do pray that as we study it together, it won't just be uh, the fact that we'll be able to get our prophetic charts and all the ducks in a row, but that we'll be greatly moved by the truths of this great book and that it will affect our lives. And therefore, we will be greatly blessed and others will be blessed through us. So the verses four through nine, uh, we have the salutation. And so it says this, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and was and is to come from the seven spirits which are before the throne. These seven churches which are in Asia, now they're in what was called Asia Minor, uh, modern day Western Turkey. Uh, the churches were located in a rough crescent in the western area of the province of Roman proconsular Asia. Now, what's interesting is, because uh, we're all thinking about Turkey right now, but where these seven churches are, no doubt they would have felt the effects of the earthquake, but it isn't where the earthquake occurred. In fact, I was looking on a map as to where the, uh, on Google, where the churches are and where the earthquake epicenter was. And actually, the epicenter is closer to Antioch. Uh, remember, the uh, Paul and Barnabas sent out from Antioch. It's closer to that area. Uh, it's kind of would be southeast of where these churches were. These churches are local. And seven of them in number. Now, of course, seven is a symbolic number in Scripture. It speaks of completeness as in the seven days of creation. It's kind of interesting that another dominant number in the book of Revelation is 12. And 12 is has, again, the idea of completion. There's 12 months in a year. There's seven days in a week. And so, again, we're going to see the book of Revelation is bringing things to completion. We're going to see that through and through. But just, to, just so that we understand symbolically, seven has the idea of completeness. Uh, perfection is the same idea, too. Uh, so these seven churches, I want to suggest to you, even though they're, these letters are written to individual churches that existed at this time, they're also representative of churches that may appear at any time in the history of the church. There, there is a, a church that's going through persecution right now in the world. There is a church that is like Laodicea, that, that has great material prosperity, prosperity, but great spiritual poverty. And so uh, we, we certainly are going to see that. But I just wanted to mention this important thing, that 
when we think of these seven churches, um, if, if we if we look at where they are, one of the things that would tell us that this is this is not just letters to these seven churches, but it's a batch sample of what might be seen at any church at any time. And the reason I say that is that in that very region, there are two other churches that we know about that do not receive a letter. The church at Colossae is in the same area of Western Turkey. Doesn't get a letter. Another one, Hierapolis. Uh, there was an, a church established by Epaphras. Uh, Laodicea, remember there were three churches Epaphras was involved in starting, and Laodicea was one of them. It gets a letter, but Colossae and Hierapolis don't, which would tell us that this these seven, not only uh, are they real letters to real churches, but they're representative of churches everywhere. And we'll think about that more deeply when we look at the letters to the seven churches. Notice that he says, uh, to these seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace. Grace and peace. Again, just these are the normal standard greetings. We know that grace is that uh, Greek greeting, charis, and uh, peace is the Hebrew greeting, shalom. And But it's ironic that a book that reveals the thunderings of divine judgment on the earth starts out with grace and peace <laughs> because we're going to see a lot of turmoil in the world we're going to see a lot of trouble and catastrophe uh, catastrophe throughout the book and yet here amazingly it starts with grace and peace and it's the wonderful heritage of believers remember even these churches this is the persecution under the Roman emperor Domitian, that is when this letter is written. And this is, unlike Nero's persecution, which was primarily, primarily in Rome, this persecution is empire-wide, much wider. And so in the midst of persecution, these, these believers who will be feeling some of it uh, Smyrna particularly is feeling the full force of it, but, but all of them will be feeling something of it. And yet he says to them, grace and peace. And isn't it wonderful to know that we can experience grace, his sustaining grace, and his peace that passes all understanding, whatever is going on in the world. And we thank God that many of our believers uh, that are going through great persecution right now and yet uh, their lives are marked by grace and peace uh, because again it comes to us from the triune god and he then goes on and says from where does this grace and peace come from and it's interesting that i do believe we have a trinitarian greeting here uh, we have all three persons of the godhead mentioned in verses four and five and so he begins by saying first of all grace and peace from him which is the ever-present one and which was eternally uh, was in existence and which is to come in other words he there's no ending he will constantly be and so it's speaking of the father and then we have from the seven spirits which are before his throne. It's a reference to the Holy Spirit in all his fullness and completeness. And then from Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ is mentioned last. Often when we mention this order, we talk about the Father, and then we talk about the Son, and then we talk about the Holy Spirit. But the reason that the Lord Jesus is mentioned last in this particular greeting is that John has a lot more to say about the Lord Jesus. And so he's going to, it's going to be a lot longer, the section that deals with the Lord Jesus. And so this thoroughly Trinitarian greeting is given from him, which is, which was, which is to come, the eternal father, the ever present one. And then from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. And the idea is this, that this blessed Holy Spirit in all his completeness and all his fullness is going to be uh, active and available in all the seven churches. Uh, he's 
He's everywhere. He's able to help every church at every time in history. And it is interesting that some have made the connection uh, when we think of the seven spirits before the throne with Isaiah chapter 11. And we might just turn there in verses one and two. Uh, it says, and uh, Isaiah 11 verse one, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And then it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom. So you got the Lord, spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of uh, counsel and might and knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And there's seven references there. And so it's the idea of the spirit in all of his divine fullness. And then it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. We just want to just focus on these three little statements about Jesus Christ. First of all, who is the faithful witness? Notice he is the faithful witness, uh, the faithful or true or accurate witness, the one who revealed the Father perfectly. That's the idea that in, in when he came into this world, uh, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten who is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. And so he is, he is the faithful witness, faithful or true, accurate witness of the father, one who revealed him perfectly. The word the is singular. He only truly represents the father perfectly. Every other representative of the father falls short somehow, some way, but he represented him perfectly and this word witness uh it's the greek word martus from which we get the idea of martyr and the thought is this that the lord jesus witnessed of the love of the father even in his death he was the perfect witness of the father witnessed of the love of the father in even in his death and so that would be if you like looking at jesus ministry in the past, at his first advent, he came to reveal the Father, and he was the perfect witness. We might say this is Christ as prophet. Remember, uh, th there was a promise uh, given in Deuteronomy 18 that God would raise up a prophet like unto me, and the Lord Jesus was that one who was that prophet who declared fully the mind and heart of God, and so it looks at Christ and his prophetic ministry. And then the first begotten from the dead. Says Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. First begotten, uh, special, unique is the idea. Not, uh, not only, it's not that he was the first to be raised from the dead uh, because others were raised from the dead, but we, we remember they all died again. But the Lord Jesus was unique in history in two ways. First of all, he is the only one who raised himself from the dead. Now, of course, we know the Father raised him. We know the Spirit was involved in raising him. But remember, in John's Gospel, chapter 2, he said, destroy this body. And then he says this, in three days, I will raise it up. <laughs> so unique uh, in the sense of he raised himself from the dead. And secondly, unique in the sense that he was the first one to be resurrected from the dead, never to die again, never to die again. Uh, he lives, as we know, in the power now of an endless life. And of course, he's he's the first begotten or the firstborn of the dead, it means he's first in rank over those who have yet to be resurrected. He will always have that preeminent place amongst those that are risen from the dead. And so what are we brought, what's brought before us now? I, I want to suggest to you that it speaks of Christ's present ministry. You see, what is he doing with this endless life, this resurrected life, this life that has uh, brought him back as the firstborn from the dead? Well, right now he's still working for us, isn't he? He's our priest. He's the one that as our great high priest ever makes intercession for us, ever acts as our advocate before the Father. And so 
It speaks of his present ministry. And then we see the third reference here, and the prince of the kings of the earth. And again, surely that speaks of his coming rule and reign, when he will indeed be the one who reigns resplendent over planet earth and all the kindreds of the earth will come and acknowledge him as that king of kings and lord of lords zechariah uh, the great prophecy of zechariah chapter 14 and verse 8 we read this speaking of this glorious day when he comes to reign it says and it shall be in that day that living water shall go forth from jerusalem um a half of them towards the former sea, half towards the hinder sea. Uh, and that's not the verse I'm looking for. Verse three, verse four, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. Uh, so he's coming again and he's coming to reign and he will reign. Uh, verse uh, 17, it shall be in that, um, so verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles. And so he's going to come, he's going to reign, he's going to reign as king, and he's going to reign for a thousand years. So future, we're thinking of the Lord Jesus as king. The millennial reign, well, he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. So isn't it interesting? that as this grace and peace brought from the triune God, from the eternally existent God, from the spirit in all his fullness, and from Jesus Christ, the great prophet, priest, and king, uh, this uh, wonderful truth is brought uh, to us and to believers in persecution, just to know that they can know grace and peace from uh, this blessed triune God. And then as he goes on to speak about the Lord Jesus, we've thought about him as a prophet. We've thought of him as a priest. We've thought of him as a king. But now we're reminded of him as a savior. It says again at the end of verse five, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yes, he's a savior. And what a price he paid in order to wash us from our sins in his own. He had to shed his precious blood. And, and so we're reminded of the fact that of the extent and the costliness of his love, washed us, cleaned us, cleansed us up from all our sin in his own precious blood, and then has taken us, once rebels, once uh, far from God, steeped in sin and rebellion, and he's made us kings and priests unto God and his father. And then the response should be this, to him, <laughs> the one that's done so much, took these rebels and made them kings and priests. Uh, what should be the response be? Well, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And I hope you all in your hearts could say a hearty amen, right? Because this is what he's done. This is the great work of the Savior, marvelous work that he's done. And what does it mean that he's made us Kings and priests. Well, there's a reference again, Old Testament reference, Exodus 19 and verse 6. I want you to see Exodus 19, verse 6. We read this. This is should have been Israel's portion. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That should have been the portion of the children of Israel. But now we rebels, sinners of the Gentiles, God has now made us kings and priests. And the idea is this, that we are going to reign with him as kings. We're going to, we're going to reign with him. And, and we're going to see that throughout the book of Revelation, that there's going to be references to the saints reigning with Christ over the millennial earth. And, and what an amazing thing. And it's good to remind ourselves that we are currently training for reigning. That's, that's our current position. I'll just give you a couple of references. Chapter 5 and verse 10 says, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. 
the very ones that he's made kings and priests, we shall reign on the earth. Uh, Revelation 20 and verses four through six. I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, verse 6, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, we're kings. We're going to reign with Christ. Now, of course, he'll, he's the king of kings, we'll be, but we're going to reign with him. And then we're priests. And again, a priest had a twofold function. Um, first of all, to represent God before the world, uh, this royal priesthood coming out from the presence of God, bringing blessing, just like Melchizedek did. Uh, and so uh, we're to be ambassadors for Christ. We're to be a royal priesthood representing him before the world. And then we also represent the people before the Lord in intercession, going into the presence of God as a holy priesthood. So we our kings and he's washed us with his blood and he's made us kings and priests to god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen and so verse seven he says now behold take a good long look this whole book is leading to a climactic event and what is that climactic event that we're going to be seeing the first glimpse of it here, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. He's going to make us kings and priests. What about the rest? What about those that said we will not have this man to reign over us? What, what's going to happen with them? They deliberately said we don't want him to reign over us and then well, we get a glimpse of what's going to happen to them. Behold, he comes with clouds. Remember when he ascended uh, into heaven? It was, he was carried in the clouds, wasn't he? Acts chapter 1. I want to just look at a few references to this idea of clouds. Acts 1 verse 4, being assembled. Uh, sorry, verse 14. Acts 1 14 says, these all. That's not right either. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, verse nine, it says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went out, behold, two men stood up in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And so how did he go up? Well, he was taken up into a cloud. How, what's he going to be like when he comes back again? Well, it says he comes with clouds. Now, uh, further references, Daniel 7, please. Daniel chapter 7. The Lord referred to this when the religious leadership, priests, and uh, were pressing him. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. And he referred to this reference, verse 13 of Daniel 7. I saw in the, the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and so again we see something of the reference to clouds and so uh, we could say this psalm 104 and verse 3 i'm going to just make one of the reference to clouds after this but psalm 104 verse 3 just tells us this speaking of god and it says in verse three, it says, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. He makes the clouds his chariot. Jesus, when he comes back, how is he going to come back? Well, he's going to come with clouds. 
Now, just another suggestion. And this suggestion comes to us from Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Uh, sorry, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Another reference to clouds is a cloud of witnesses, a great cloud of witnesses. And it's certain that although the Lord Jesus will come on the clouds, and we do believe that perhaps uh, the clouds will be his chariot, but there's another kind of thought that there'll be clouds of saints coming with him, clouds of witnesses, uh, a great cloud of witnesses, uh, because we know that when he comes back to the earth, we're going to come with him. We're going to come with him to this earth. And, and so all the saints, the holy ones, were going to come with the Lord. So that's just another, another thought to throw into the mix. Notice it says that when he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. I suppose there was a day when people would wonder, how could that be? It's not difficult to understand that now, is it? Every eye shall see him. Uh, it will be a, a, a sight that is, will be witnessed around the globe, every eye shall see him then it says and they also which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall will because of him now i want to just think about all they that pierced him because the ones that literally pierced him in john 19 37 actually it was one individual that did it it was a roman soldier that pierced his side uh, well he's long dead and yet this seems to speak of living people alive and witnessing this event. And so it says also they which pierced him. So what does that have in view? Can I suggest two things? First of all, that Roman soldier, he pierced him. But who was it that really was, was agitating the mob and getting uh, uh, this uh, Pontius Pilate to act well. We know it was the Jews, the religious leaders. And so in a sense, although they got the Romans agents to do their dirty work, they were responsible in a sense for piercing him. But then the Romans also were complicit. Roman justice failed and they uh, certainly uh, were complicit in this crime. And isn't it interesting that in the last days, there will still be uh, a remnant of Israel, of Jews, that will be gathered in Jerusalem. And many of them in unbelief, many of them still following the Antichrist. But some who have not gone uh, the way of the Antichrist, and uh, it tells us in Zechariah 12 and verse 10, again back in that marvelous book of Zechariah, that there's a day coming when they will look on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12, verse 10, when we've looked at before, I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Of course, we go into chapter 13, and show that the entire nation will be in mourning like they'd lost their firstborn son. And so we can say this, that when Christ comes, he will come uh, to redeem the faithful remnant of Israel that are surrounded by the, the enemies uh, of Antichrist. And, uh, and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be crying out, uh, save now, save now, uh, Hosanna, Hosanna. And out of heaven, the Lord Jesus is going to come and they'll look on him whom they've pierced. And we've already mentioned this. They'll mourn for him. They'll mourn because the, the realization, the awful realization for this remnant in Israel will be, we have crucified our own Messiah. And they'll mourn like they're mourning for the firstborn. But then at this time as well, we believe that there will be a revived Roman Empire. And they too, the ones who were complicit in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, they too will look upon him whom they have pierced. 
And then it says, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And so there, there will be, now, by the way, notice this. I believe that many um, who are rebellion, in rebellion against God, unrepentant, the earth dwellers, they're going to see Christ come. Those that have survived the horrors of the tribulation, they're going to see Christ come. And they're going to wail because they're going to realize they've backed the wrong horse. <laughs> they, they've, 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 they've taken the mark of the beast. They've, they've followed the false Messiah. And when the real Messiah comes, they will wail. Now, just an aside here. This is a very, by the way, a very important aside, but an aside nevertheless. One thing this verse proves is that the world will not all be converted waiting for Christ's coming. Our optimistic brethren, who are post-millennial, who believe that the world will be converted by the church and Christ will come back to a world that's waiting for him and converted, this verse alone would say to me, no, that's not the case. Why would they wail because of him if they've believed on him? <laughs> They'd rejoice at seeing the bridegroom come. But no, they will wail because of him, because they'll realize they've they have they've taken the mark, and they have followed the false Messiah, and they will share in his fate. So the Lord Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the a and the Z, the beginning and the ending of the alphabet, as we would say. This is the first and the last letter in the Greek alphabet. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Again, just uh, emphasizing the eternality and deity of the Lord Jesus. He's the beginning. He's the ending. He's the Almighty. Again, Isaiah 44, uh, Old Testament allusions galore in this book. And we, we want to try and hit as many of them as we, we can as we go through. We'll try to be faithful in doing that. But Isaiah 44 and verse 6, we read this amazing scripture. It says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. And so clearly the Lord Jesus, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. We see it again in verse 17 uh, of chapter one. When I saw him, I fell on my face as dead and I had laid, he laid his right hand upon me saying unto him, fear not, I am the first and the last. And so again, the eternality and the, uh, the, the power of Christ, the almighty one, uh, all powerful one. And so we read, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. Remember, he's writing to saints that are suffering because of the Domitian persecution. He says, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. I know what it is to be persecuted for my faith. I, I, I know exactly what that looks like, John says. Uh, I'm with you. I'm your brother. I'm your companion. Uh, in these things and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I'm sharing in the suffering. I'll share in the glory that will come afterwards. And uh, notice he, he knew what it was to be persecuted for his faith. Again, we're told uh, that he was boiled in oil. It's hard to imagine that he was boiled in oil and survived it. Hard for us to even grasp that. And then was banished to this barren island in the Aegean Sea, called the Isle, which is called Patmos. And so he he's your companion. He's been through it. And why? Because of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, we might ask ourselves, in days to come, although we will not be in the tribulation period, uh, we'll see that as we go, that's not for us. But I suspect that many believers in the history of the church have experienced great persecutions. And it seems like uh, opinion against us is, is the tide is turning. I just heard recently in Nebraska, they tried to uh, uh, put a bill forward to ban Christian camps 
because they called them indoctrination camps. Uh, it failed, but you can see the way things are going. There's a increased hostility towards Christianity. And so we may also get to share something of these things for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, I know that right now it's hard for us to imagine, but I know that he who promised grace and peace to these believers will also give grace and peace to us if that is what we have to face. And so we notice in verse 10, or I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet. A prisoner of Rome, isolated on a bleak and sterile island, we might say this, that John is literally put outside the camp. The Roman Empire says we have no place for this man. But who does he see when he's outside the camp? <laughs> he has a vision of the glorified Christ. And isn't that the promise? That when we're outside the camp, that's where the Lord is. That's where he, that's where he suffered outside the camp. And that's where his presence is. The great epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 12 and 13 says this. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, to him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Let's go forth to him. That's where he is, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And here's John outside the camp, bearing his reproach, but he gets a glorious vision of him. Now, I want you to notice this. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, the timing of the vision. It was the Lord's day, the first day of the week. Now I realize some people think it's the day of the Lord. And again, maybe some of you think that, and we'll have to lovingly disagree. I believe it's the Lord's day. It was on the Lord's day, the first day of the week, just as the Lord's supper was not a common meal, but one given spiritual significance and marked out a special set aside for him who requested that we do this in remembrance of him, even so the Lord's day is not just any other day. It's, it's the day he rose from the grave, John 20 and verse 1, the first day of the week, early in the morning, uh, he had risen. Uh, it's the day he appeared in the midst of his disciples, John 20 and verse 19. It's the day when the disciples came together to break bread, Acts 20 and verse 7. It's the day when the collection of the saints was taken, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. And it's the day when John, who's away from the saints, right? He's in, as far as we can see, isolation on this barren island. But somehow he must have still scratched a calendar on the wall. And it's the Lord's day. <laughs> and in his mind, it's set apart, sanctified uh, to the Lord. And we notice that he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, of course, we want to be on the spirit every day, but he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And what we could say is this, that he's in a right condition to receive revelation from God in the spirit on the Lord's day. And isn't it good when saints gather together in the spirit on the Lord's day, ready to receive from God. And while in that condition, absorbed with the things of the spirit, he hears a voice from behind him like a great voice of a trumpet. It says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet. Again, could I just say this? And in Daniel chapter one, it reveals to us the moral character suitable to receiving revelations from God. Remember, Daniel wouldn't eat and defile himself with the king's meat. And, and God uh, took this, this young boy who had convictions, and he revealed great things to him that were hidden from others. And so the moral character suitable for revelations from God, here we have a spiritual attitude in John, suitable for receiving revelations from God. Are we in a moral and spiritual condition that's suitable to receiving from God truth, insights from the word of God. 
so he hears this great voice of a trumpet. It's interesting how the voice of a trumpet is connected so often in God speaking uh, clearly. Uh, we read uh, in Exodus 19, verse 16, uh, when the, the law was given on Mount Sinai, and there are lots of things that accompanied the giving of the law, but one of them is this sound of a trumpet, Exodus 19, verse 16, uh, we read this, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings in a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Because we're going to see in the book of Revelation, there's going to be thunderings, there's going to be lightnings, there's going to be the voice of a trumpet. The very same things we're going to see in the very in the book of Revelation, as was seen when the law was given on Mount Sinai. Uh, when Christ comes for his bride, what's going to be accompanying that? Well, the trump of God, right? There's going to be the, the blast of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And those that are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And again, we might just, we often mention this, but Paul says, if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to battle? How we need the clear voice of a trumpet, as it were, in ministry in these days, clear messages, clear from God, clear to get the attention of the saints. So he hears the great voices of a trumpet. And what did that voice of a trumpet say? Saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And so again, Lord Jesus affirming his deity again. He's the Alpha Omega. He's the first and the last. And he says, what you see, now again, not what you're hearing, because it's all given to him in vision and symbolic pictures. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. And so it says this, and I turned in verse 12 to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Interesting that when John turned to see the voice, the first thing that he saw was seven golden lampstands. And they're interpreted for us very clearly in verse 20, where it says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand in the seven golden candlesticks, seven stars of the angels of the seven churches, the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And perhaps a great way for us to, to end here, we'll develop it further tomorrow. But what God wants John to see, what the Lord wants John to see, is the significance and importance of these local churches to the heart of God. Do we realize how important these testimonies are to God and Christ, and especially in the dark age in which we live. Every local assembly is very important to God in the darkness that surrounds us. Uh, it, these testimonies are for God to, to shine for him and for Christ in the darkness. And especially in a time of persecution, how we need the church, how we need each other, how we need the, the encouragement of these churches now we're going to develop it further we're going to take more time but uh, our time has gone uh, this message has shortly come to pass <laughs> and uh, may the lord encourage us uh, as we continue on in this book of the greatness of the person and work of the lord jesus that he would love us and that he would wash us from our sins in his own blood and make us kings and priests to god amen